Okay, so today I will be analysing the poem Rooms by Charlotte Mew. First, let's talk a little bit about the poet. So, um, the poem was written in the 1920s. This was only a few years before Mew died. In the poem, the poet seems to look back on her life and possibly reflects on her disappointment and frustration at the way that things turned out for her family. So, this is in the case if you were to assume that the speaker and the poet are equal. Um, so, three of her siblings died. Two of her siblings were committed to insane asylums. And this left only Mew and her sister Anne, who at the time was very sick. When her father passed away, Charlotte and her sister suffered financially and they were forced to downsize. Eventually, all they could afford was a small rented room that they needed to share together, possibly the little damp room um, that she refers to at the end of the poem. So we could say that the poem has um, certain autobiographical elements to it. Okay, so the deeper meaning. Life is unreliable. It is full of uncertainty. There is only one constant in life, and that is the fact that it will eventually end. So... This is a very sad poem and it reflects the lack of hope in the speaker's life. The speaker seems to look forward to death as she believes that it will offer her an escape from her pain and suffering. This is seen at the end of the poem when she refers to her coffin as a quiet bed, as though death would offer her with a sort of relief from all of this pain. So this is the poem, it's only one stanza long. I remember rooms that had their part in the steady slowing down of the heart. The room in Paris, the room in Geneva, the little damp room with the seaweed smell and that ceaseless maddening sound of the tide. Rooms where for good or for ill things died. But there is the room where we too lie dead. Though every morning we seem to wake and might just as well seem to sleep again. As we shall somewhere in the other quieter, dustier bed. Out there in the sun, in the rain. So first of all, in the first two lines, we have the use of alliteration. We have the consonants of the R sound and then the S sound. Um, this creates the feeling of living within tightly prescribed limits and the speaker's yearning for freedom from those limits. Uh, this is also seen in the nasal alliteration, in the use of the letter M and N, in remember, rooms, in down um, in the first and second lines and this is also indicative of the idea of confinement or suppressed emotion. The release of this pent-up emotion is mirrored in the aspirant alliteration in the first lines as uh, for example in have had and heart and these sounds encapsulate the dramatic tension in the poem and hint at the stifling personal and social restrictions that Mew lived in and yearned to be released from as she lived in a society that was quite she was a Victorian poet so she lived in a society where she was unable to freely express herself something that we'll look on late look at later on in the poem um, Mew uses a conceit and this is an extended metaphor uh, as she refers to her past failures and regrets as being rooms Parallelism is used in the third line, the room in Paris, the room at Geneva, and this makes them seem very similar and creates an impression of bareness and emptiness, as there is no room, no past experience that truly stands out to the speaker. If we were to assume that the speaker and the poet are equal in this poem, and that it is in fact partly autobiographical, then the room in Paris and the room in Geneva could be referring to her romantic failures. She fell in love with a woman named Ellen Darkey, something which ended in rejection and muse humiliation. And then 10 years later, so um, this romantic failure could be uh, what the room in Paris refers to. And then 10 years later, Mew experienced similar rejection with a woman named Mary Sinclair. So this could be referring to the room in Geneva. Um, so 
the in this case the rooms could be reflecting Mew's memory on her past emotional disasters. The speaker's life is indicated to become more narrow and surrounded by restrictions, and this is seen in the adjective little. This room, the little damp room, could be referring to the one that Mew and her sister were forced to move into, as I mentioned before, after they could no longer afford to live in their family home. The imagery of this room is sparse and unpleasant. The smell and sound of the ocean is described in seaweed smell. The sounds is mirrored in the sibilance of the S sound in seaweed and smell. Um, however, the sights of the ocean are not described, which indicates that the speaker has been denied one of the essential pleasures of living by the sea. And this is something that is maddening to the speaker, as seen in the fifth line. The opposition between the ceaseless movement of the tides moving in and out and against the frozen, petrified life of the speaker trapped inside this one room is driving her towards insanity, hence the use of the adjective maddening. It is as though she is being cruelly reminded of the movement of the world around her while she is stuck in time, moving nowhere except towards death. So the adjective maddening could also have an autobiographical element, as after the death of her sister, Mew became delusional and increasingly fearful that she would end up like the rest of her siblings, who, as I said before, had been forced into mental institutions. And then, uh, things died. Things is quite ambiguous, as Mew could be referring to love, but also things like optimism, happiness, and hope for the future. The hyphen emphasizes the last two words of the line, and it creates a sense of in inevitability and acceptance on the poet's um, behalf as she accepts that this is the future that fate had in store for her, and that is death. The two that Mew refers to in the brackets um, could be, is most likely referring to Mew and her sister. Lie is in present tense, and this suggests that even before Anne's death, their reduced circumstances led them to feel as though they were in fact living a kind of living death, essentially. The, rep the repetition of seem extends the idea of living death. It is also, it is as though the speaker can no longer make the distinction between the living world, the world of death, and the world of sleep. The sibilance and alliteration used in this line, we seem, uh, seem, sleep. What that does is it adds to the idea of living death as though the speaker were reflecting on her half-life through drowsy, half-open eyes, floating around on the line between life and death. And so as you probably noticed already, the eighth line is stretched out and this represents the thoughts and feelings within the poem. It is as though the lines themselves are reluctant to be confined to such a limiting space like the room which Mew and her sister were forced to, to um, downsize and live in. Although the breaking out of the cage of this line should be a joyous event, the content and sounds of the line are sad and glum, as she's essentially uh, talking about her death and how she's living a half-death. So... This conveys a sense of hopelessness. There is nothing she can do, essentially, to escape from this suffering except dying. The adjectives used to describe the bed, quieter and dustier, indicate that she is referring to her grave. It is as though she is looking forward to lying beneath her grave, as though death would provide her with a relief from her endless suffering, because at least her grave will be out there in the sun and in the rain, as, well, I haven't highlighted it here, but as is mentioned in the last line of the 
of the poem. Um, so the sun and the rain refers to the things that she has been missing out on her life. Warmth, comfort, love in the case of sun. Excitement, danger, exposure to risk in the case of rain. Mew was a Victorian poet. She was a woman and most likely a lesbian, as um, I indicated before, with her past romantic failures. So she lived in a socially repressive culture and these restrictions must have been suffocating for her and this is and this suffocation is reflected in the poem and the ever shrinking walls of the rooms slowly choking her towards her death until um death seems to be the only release from that pain and that suffering to the speaker okay so now i've arranged some topic areas um for an essay to write this poem on in case it were to come up in the exam. So first topic area, I would focus on the tightly prescribed limits and restrictions that seem to be pressing down on the speaker. For the second topic area, I would um, look at how the rooms uh, are a metaphor for the speaker's past romantic failures and how they have become smaller and smaller and show the narrowing of her life and for the final topic area i'd focus on how the speaker looks forward to her death and believes that it will provide her with an escape from her suffering thank you very much for watching hope that was helpful